All right, this is Bronco's 135th scale um, uh, assault glider, the, uh, the DFS-230. They were made by different companies in Germany. Fiesler made them, and so did Heinkel. Um, it was the primary weapon used to assault the uh, Ford at Edmund ML in 1940, uh, the very successful raid on Edmund ML. I had the pleasure of actually seeing the fort firsthand in 1982 when I was stationed in England and went over to Belgium. Um, and they actually have a place is now a really nice museum with a lot of the equipment that was left over by the Germans and by the Belgians. And it was uh, really, really interesting. If you get a chance, uh, this is one of the books on the raid and it's very, very worthwhile reading. Um, as far as the model goes, uh, I'll say right now so that people will know whoever see these photographs or whatever, uh, they had, the model was damaged on the way here. The column is broken off and the canopy broke off. Oh. So uh, if anybody looks at the photographs or anything inside, you'll see that the control column is broken. So all you snarky, so, snarky dudes, just yeah. let it go. Yeah. <laughs> no trolls. No trolls. Um, the kid has some uh, serious fit issues that I had to deal with. Uh, luckily, I was able to solve it without having to do too much filling. The wing joints themselves were actually quite good. Um, as far as inaccuracies, the model, unfortunately, being a glider, they give you the, the wings are formed with a very straight dihedral, which you know no glider is. So I had to actually apply heat to the bottom of the wing after it was built to actually give it that negative curve, which you will see here, yeah. Yeah. that droop. That's not part of the kit. I had to actually do that to the wings to give it, oh. the, give it that droop. Okay. Another interesting, oh, I think I hear the control column in there. Yeah, I saw it, I saw it just float yeah. by. Uh, this is some, one thing that I also found out when I was painting this model. If you notice, the RLM 65 light blue has got a sheen to it. And that is because when they used it as a dope on these canvas covered airplanes, it actually dried gloss or a semi gloss. So I decided not to put any kind of flat coat on it. Um, the uh, paintwork is, again, reflecting the paint job of the typical German camouflage of the 1940s with RLM uh, 70, 71, and 65. The markings, if you notice there, they're, they're toned down because uh, they used them on the raid to actually show very little of the actual markings of the airplanes to fool the enemy as to who was actually flying over their territory at the time. So that's the reason why the crosses and the swastikas are toned down. The kit actually comes with figures. I haven't built them yet. Unfortunately, they're really, they're actually terrible. Uh, these drawings look a lot better than the actual figures do. The figures are actually an old uh, set of um, early generation dragon figures that were sold to Bronco to put in with the kit. and. Uh, like I said, they're, they're very poor. I'd have to do a lot of detail work to them to make them look better. But eventually I will, I will get around to do that. Um, the interior of the model was actually quite beautiful. I mean, the inside of that detailed interior is, is actually very, very nice. Even the framework inside the, uh, inside the fuselage shows a steel tubular structure with canvas going around it. And it shows uh, the floor work and everything. It's just really superb for the kit. Unfortunately, even with all the panels that you can remove and show, uh, like this panel will come off too, if I can get it off here. Don't break it some more. Yeah, really. Yeah. Here we go. There you go. It shows the interior there. Yeah, that's really neat. It is, yeah. And yeah. Uh, the, uh, the framework is actually done in sections. So it's not like they give you the whole slate from one end to the other. It's actually done in sections, which actually works pretty well although it does have a couple of problems with fit. But uh, overall, it was a very good kit to build. I think I've got about 20, 22 hours in this. What about the, uh, the plexiglass uh, side windows? I mean, were they individual ones? It's a very, very interesting point. Uh, they're individuals. They're, they come, you know, individuals in the glass. Yeah. And the instructions tell you not to glue them. You pop them in place. Wow. And, but unfortunately, if you see, there's a few windows missing because they have popped right that back out. <laughs> and they're in yeah. there with the control stick. And they're stick. in there with the control stick, yeah. Right. So, they, so these gliders were multi-use? They would like take the wings off and fly them, you know, 
put them in a cargo plane or something, or were they one-time no, no, one no, no, use? No, no, they they were used strictly as assault gliders. Uh, they the wings were not easily removed or anything. So like they that. were just one-time use. One-time one, use. Once and done. Well, if they recovered them, you know, they yeah. did recover them. They would repair them and use them again. Yeah. Um, they only produced about 400 of these gliders, and most of the ones that were used at Edmund ML, I think there was 18 used in the strike. Um, they were all recovered, sent back to Germany, and those were then again used in okay. the invasion of Crete, which is the next big... Because, uh, you know, like the Waco there. gliders, they came apart. You could right. take them all apart, right. you know. Well, these probably did, too. I mean, some of them probably were damaged beyond repair, and then they just abandoned them. Right. Yeah. I would guess that they likely went by rail. Probably, yeah. Uh, if they were transported, yeah. the, the what I'm saying is that the wings were not quick disconnect, like... Like, the Wacos. Like yeah. normal, right. or the Wacos or the normal yeah. gliders, yeah. Right. From what I can see of the wing structure going into the fuselage that the model gives you, it looks like a very complicated joint. So it, uh, the, the attaching point to the wing shows a lot of uh, intricate parts yeah. to the joint wing joint. So I don't think it was a quick disconnect okay. wing. I see the Germans were the pioneers in gliders. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. You know, they were, yeah. Um, this kit is a really nice fabric. Yeah, uh, fabric, yeah, yeah contour. I, yeah. I, um, I, I was able to enhance that using uh, 300 grit uh, Tamiya sandpaper and to bring, really bring it out. Uh, oh, yeah, the, the, only other, the only thing actually scratch built to the models were the control cables on the ailerons and on the tail surfaces. Okay. Everything else is pretty much right out of the box. Um, it uh, very interesting th thing feature about this airplane was the, this cabin area back here. The second man in the in the uh, in the uh, cabin area would actually stand up through there and can fire this machine gun, and he had a rather intricate harness that he snapped into. That's what the D, what the seat belts are in there, mm. but the kit doesn't give you the pilot seat belts. Oh, so those those pilot seat belts there are, are 35th scale or 32nd scale uh, Edward hmm. seat belts for a German German airplane, interesting. which is uh, kind of interesting. <laughs> um, Anybody has any other any questions? No. What do Germans no. use for a tow plane? Hmm? What do you usually uh, use for a tow plane? JU-52. Uh, JU usually a JU-52 used yeah. on these. Hmm. Yeah. And they tried that. Because uh, were these yeah. supported with with uh, airborne troops? So, yes. Okay, uh, what so would happen? These would be the assault guys. Right. Kind of like the German special forces of the of the Fallschirm right. here, which were the paratroopers. They would go in first, and the way they took Edmund Amell was basically just that. They flew and landed. The, the, uh, the assault gliders with nine guys per glider. And by the way, the pilot is also an assault troop. He just doesn't fly the airplane and then just sit around. Um, if I can find the drawing, here it is. Here, if you look at this. This is the entire Fort Eben ML establishment. And the gliders landed on top of this. And these gliders can land and come to a complete stop inside of 200 feet. Oh. Yeah, so it's got it's a really good. slow yeah. approach speed. Yeah. Well, yeah. it's a really, really yeah. good braking system. Yeah. And, Throw an uh, anchor out. <laughs> well, they, they, that, that's, that's the, the interesting thing, is that what they did have, they modified the, these gliders for that event. And what it is, is on the left-hand side of the cockpit, there's a large lever right by the pilot's left-hand side. Yeah. And when he pulls that back, a huge <laughs> chunk of rod <laughs> metal comes out of the bottom an anchor. and digs yeah. yeah. into right. the ground. Uh, the, dis, the, uh, the disadvantage to that is that in, in flying the thing and coming in at about 60 miles an hour, you can easily break, break your an wrist. Arm. Sure, yeah. And three of the guys, uh, three yeah. of the uh, yeah. assault glider pilots broke their wrists on, on landing. Mm. Uh, okay. Also, the assault gliders were the only chapter or the only group of Fallschirmjäger troops uh, throughout World War II that arrived with their guns, or with their weapons. As you know, German paratroopers, they had a horrible parachute that actually dangled from behind, yeah. and they had no form of control whatsoever. Right, right. So the paratroopers basically allowed the winds to just take them where they were, and when they landed, they had no, tr no, no weapons. They had to go to the parachuted the canister, the canister with all the, that had all the weapons in it. That's why they lost more than half of the assault troops at Crete. Yeah.